Hi, everyone. Welcome. So good to see you here. I'm Marion Owen. Some people know me as the Gardener's Coach. We're coming live to you. I'm coming live to you from Kodiak, Alaska. And I've been gardening here for nearly 40 years. See my gray hair? Mm -hmm. So here's what we're going to do today. Got my little list. Let me turn on the chat for one thing. Yay! Um, Leslie, Northwest Montana. Hi, good to see you, Leslie. This is great. So wherever you garden or hang your hoe, put it in the chat. Say hi. It'd be great. And um, do all this house cleaning here, housekeeping here. Which reminds me, if you hear some kind of odd noises off to the side here, it's because we have construction going on, so it's a little noisy. All right. We have two fabulous topics today. Before I show you those, um, I, I know people are curious about what it's like to garden in Alaska, especially Kodiak. So today, hoo hoo, it's very drippy and foggy. And you've got cherry blossoms on the right, and the roadies are starting to bloom. And yes, I have a fairy in my garden. <laughs> but all that fog. Oh my goodness, create some tremendous beauty in the garden. I'm going to have a whole workshop on just photographing in your garden. And this happens to be, for those of you that love blue poppies, this is a version of that, a variation of that. This is a white a blue poppy. This is a white Mechanopsis. Kind of looks like an egg, doesn't it? Then everybody needs a sea otter in their garden. And this is a pink flower called Celine. It's grown uh, mostly all over the world in different variations and leaf patterns, but um, pollinators just love it. And then, ha ha, I went to my favorite coffee shop the other day and sole intention was to collect coffee grounds. And lo and behold, this sign was posted on the counter and you know you're in Kodiak when people offer to give you bear spray to borrow. Now you might seem, this might seem a little odd, but we operate a bed and breakfast, for example, and people will purchase bear spray because this archipelago is two thirds of it is a bear refuge for coastal brown bears but people will purchase bear spray, but you can't take it on the plane because it's hazmat. So many people like this barista, they end up with lots of canisters of bear spray. So I thought that was pretty fun. <laughs> All right, so what we're gonna do is, Peter, hi from Waterloo, Ontario. This is great. I hope your garden continues to be doing great. Um, Barb, yes. Great. And uh, Kansas City, hot Kansas City. Margaret, I'm so sorry. I'll send you some of my rain. And Jody, hi. All righty. Uh, we're going to cover two special, special topics. One is, the first one's going to be a smoothie to love, sorbetto verdi. And I don't think you've ever had anything like this. But the thing I like about this particular smoothie is you can fool your friends. It's so healthy, they won't even know it. And the other one we're going to learn about is how to grow awesome onions. Now, for some of you, you might be thinking, you know, I already planted my onions out, but you might be growing some green onions, you might be doing some fall crops, and our friends down under who are in the middle of winter, they might be getting ready to grow onions as well. And then finally, we're going to do a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions, post them in the chat and I'll cover them at the end. And I think, um, I think that's it. So let's get started and we're gonna dive right into uh, Sorbetto Verdi. Today, I'm gonna share with you one of my all time favorite recipes for eating spinach, drinking spinach. You won't believe it. The beautiful thing about this, well, there's a lot. You can serve this special drink to non-believers, to doubters, and it's an amazing, shocking experience to see them 
just absolutely love it. I've got the recipe from this book called Plant Strong. Uh, we eat a whole food plant-based diet, but it's really for everybody. And it's called Sorbetto Verdi. And it's very easy to make. It's just five ingredients. And also I'll share with you some of the very special qualities in the ingredients that you won't find anywhere else. I'm not talking about nutrition either. So let's do this. I'll post the recipe for you in the description below, but trust me, it's only five ingredients and it's very, very easy to make. First, you're going to have two cups of grapes and you'll have two cups of ice cubes, two cups of fresh spinach. You can use frozen spinach, but I like fresh spinach. And about a quarter cup of lime juice and just a touch of maple syrup. So here we go. You'll need a heavy duty blender like this a Vitamix because you're dealing with ice cubes and you want to put the ingredients in the blender in the order I describe and, and I'll explain why. First we start with the grapes because this is going to give you the liquid to get going. See? Nice and frothy. Nice. Then I put in just part of the spinach leaves. Okay, here we go with the ice cubes. rest of the spinach. This spinach, by the way, is pretty, pretty special to us because uh, we've been growing spinach since, see, we sowed it in early September and it grew over the winter and now this is mid-June and we just finished harvesting the rest of the spinach. It's a pretty beautiful thing in Kodiak, Alaska to have four to five months of harvesting spinach before it bolts, which is usually like in two or three weeks, right? Anyway, we celebrate spinach as our favorite winter green and all around, all year green. Anyway, so you put the spinach in, add your lime juice, a splash of maple syrup, Now, one thing about the lime juice is I found this product. It's called uh, True Lime, and it's a powdered lime. And there's lots of times I have found when I was cooking professionally, we did gourmet dinner cruises and wildlife trips for 15 years, is there's many times I would make a sauce, like, or like a salsa or some sort of dip, and I wanted lime juice, but I didn't want all the liquid. Anyway, True Lime, this is great. You can get True Lemon as well. Okay, here we go. It's going to be a little loud. And that's all there is to it. It's this great kind of slurpy, frosty freeze. And you want to serve it immediately. And it's tangy lime and sweet. And the best thing is 
people don't even know there's spinach in it unless you tell them. So, mmm, really, really yummy. It's the best. So here's what I wanted to share with you as far as the ingredients go. You know, food doesn't just give us the basic, build, basic building blocks of nutrition like calcium and vitamin C and vitamin D and all of that kind of stuff. All food have spiritual qualities like energetic qualities. So I want to give you just a little taste of what we just made in this Verdi, the Sorbetto Verdi. Spinach, for example, gives you, or represents, but it gives you more uh, simplicity, right? So spinach, simplicity, qualities of simplicity. And then the grapes, you'll love this. Divine spiritual love, sympathy, isn't that nice? And then lime, lime is a brain stimulant. These days we're hearing a lot about neuroplasticity and healthy brain, healthy gut connection. So there you go. Lime is a brain stimulant. Alrighty. Thanks for joining. Okay, I kind of cut that off a little bit, but um, I just wanted to, I wanted to add that little spiritual thing on the end because it's becoming so much more evident these days that with, with all the processed food that's out there, it's even more important for us to be growing more of our own fruits and vegetables and herbs and edible flowers and have that vitality, especially when many of us are looking at aging, a quality of, of life as we age. So um, if you have any uh, questions about that, we can take a little a few questions or I can move on to, and by the way, this this smoothie, this uh, sorbetto verde, um, it kind of solves a problem for us because here in Kodiak, we like I said, we can grow this spinach for four or five months, and so it's kind of like our equivalent of zucchini in the Midwest or you know in in Central Canada. So it kind of takes care of things. I also turn spinach into my my version of of a bird's eye frozen spinach, and I don't blanch it. I don't do anything like that. I just take the, take the fresh spinach, I chop it up, and I heap it in a bowl, and I put it in the freezer, and then I pull it out, and I just jam it into jars or bags. Done. And then it's all ready for the winter or for making um, uh, pestos out of it, all kinds of things. So um, I just like to experiment with a lot of things and... You know, if it doesn't work out right, then what's the worst thing that can happen? It goes in the compost pile, right? <laughs> so this next little bit that I wanted to share with you, um, the onions, is kind of an aha moment for me. Um, taking something that I thought was really complicated and learning that, wow, it's just some simple things to, to have success in growing onions. So we're going to dive in here. What kind of grapes are you using, says Rich? Very good point. I'm using green grapes, pretty much. So for us, um, we're just lucky to get grapes, right? I went to the grocery store the other day and looked down two aisles. All, all the shelves were pretty much empty because the container ship that carried our groceries here had skipped us because of the longshoreman strike in California. Anyway, that's another reason to grow your own food, right? So it's pretty much green grapes. I've, I've used purple grapes and done different greens, which is not, not the most attractive color. And I couldn't figure out how lime was going to fit in that and fool people. So really good question. Um, the recipe book again, Jody, um, was uh, called, it's by, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember now. Help. Mm. Plant Strong. It's called Plant Strong. And the best part about this book, which is a bestseller, is the foreword of the book has very short, concise reasons why maybe olive oil is not the best for you, highly processed olive oil, um, sugar and chocolate and all those things. They're very short, concise little chapters. So I think you'd really, really like the book. 
Okay, let's dive into onions and my four tips for growing great onions and the number one tip that I learned, my aha moment. For 20 years, I couldn't grow an onion to save my soul. I could never get an onion, just something that looked like a, like a giant leek. If you struggled to grow proper onions, then what I'm about to share might be just the answer you've been looking for. I tried everything. Then one day I was out in the garden and I phoned the extension service at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And that's where I knew they had an onion expert on staff. Kevin, I said, now right now I can't remember if that's his real name. Why do some of my onions form bulbs, but most of them don't? It seems so random. What am I doing wrong? Here's the essence of what Kevin shared with me that day. And ever since, I've grown onions like this. Now the development of the bulb of an onion plant is a delicate process, a process that can be influenced by a variety of factors, including how the onion seedling or set is transplanted. You see, if an onion seedling is transplanted too deeply, it might not form a proper bulb. Here's why. Onion plants are unique in that the part we typically eat, the bulb, forms above the ground. The bulb of an onion is actually a modified stem and it needs to be at or near the surface where it can get adequate sunlight and air. Now, when onion seedlings are planted too deeply, the plant will direct its energy in trying to push the shoot up towards the sunlight instead of focusing on the bulb formation. The end result is a weak plant with a small or non-existent bulb and you end up with something that resembles a leek, right? It's totally edible, but you won't be able to store it. Now before I share how deep to plant an onion seedling, I want to share with you my four best tips that I've adopted over 35 years of growing onions. Onions that form honest to goodness bulbs. The first three, how I should I say, uh, form the foundation. And then the last one is the final step that's putting the seedling in the ground. Number one, choose the right onion variety. Now, day length or photo period plays a big role in determining the kind of onion you should choose to grow. This is because onions are photoperiodic plants, which means their growth and development are affected by the length of the day or the amount of light they receive. So let me explain. Onions are typically categorized into three types based on their responses to daylight. You have short day onions, long day onions, and day neutral onions. Short day onions require fewer hours of daylight to trigger the bulb formation, typically around 10 to 12 hours. In a moment, I'll share with you a really nifty online chart where you can find the day length in your area for any given month. Short day onions are best suited for southern regions where the days are shorter. Long day onions, these onions require more daylight hours to begin bulb formation, typically around 14 to 16 hours of daylight. They're suited for northern regions where summer days are longer. I'll be using long day onions in my example since I live and garden in Kodiak, Alaska. Then you have day neutral onions. These onions form bulbs regardless of the amount of sunlight they get and can be grown in almost any region. So when buying onion seeds or sets, it's really important to be familiar with what kind of onion would work best for your location. And as always, I tell gardeners, if you're not sure, be a citizen scientist and try a few. Okay. In a northern climate where the length of the summer daylight is long, you would want to plant long day onions, right? These varieties will use the extended daylight hours to produce foliage or leaves. Now, when the days start to get shorter, this signals the plant to begin bulb formation. Now, listen to this. 
the larger the top growth at this point, the larger the bulb will be, as it uses the energy stored in the foliage to form the bulb. I'll say that again. The larger the top growth, the larger the bulb will be, as it uses the energy stored in the foliage, the leaves, to form the bulb. So by matching your onion type to your region's day length, you'll ensure that your onions will receive the proper amount of sunlight they need. Long day onions are tailored to thrive in regions with long day lengths, which means latitudes of 37 degrees north and above. A few popular options include Walla Walla, Ilsa Craig, I hope I pronounced that right, and Sweet Spanish. These varieties can withstand the cool growing conditions and produce large flavorful bulbs. Number two, preparing your soil. Onions prefer well draining soil. Heavy soils like our butter clay should be amended with organic matter such as compost to improve drainage or tilth as it's called, like soil structure. Also important is the pH. The ideal pH for onions is between 6 and 7. If you don't know what your soil pH is, I highly recommend getting your soil tested to determine whether you need to adjust your soil's pH. Now many gardeners don't realize that onions are heavy feeders, meaning they require a lot of nutrients. Remember, they are a stem crop, not a root crop like potatoes and carrots, that do not require a lot of nitrogen and other nutrients. So for onions, incorporate organic compost or well-rotted manure into your soil before planting. On to number three, watering your onions. While onions need regular watering, they don't like to be waterlogged. They don't like wet feet. Like I said, adding organic matter helps with drainage, but I've been known to cover my onions with mini hoops should the heavens open up for too long. For more information about mini hoops and raised beds, check out this video. Try to maintain even moisture, especially during bulb development, which begins when day length reaches 14 to 16 hours, in my case. Here's the online chart I told you about. It's on the U.S. Navy's amazing webpage called Duration of Daylight Darkness Table for one year. You can look up the amount of day length for your location. I'll post the link in the description below. It's pretty easy to use, and I'll be creating a separate video with tips on how fellow gardeners can get the most out of it. For our latitude on Kodiak Island of 58 degrees north, we cross the 14-hour mark on April 11th. Now for tip number four, planting onion seedlings. I used to buy onion sets, but I have found over the years that starting onions from seed gives me a better success rate. It's a lot less expensive and troublesome than purchasing sets. I know of a commercial greenhouse operator that stopped buying onion sets because they often harbored aphids. When seedlings are six to eight weeks old and the soil is workable, it's time to transplant. Here's a simple step-by-step -step process to planting your onion seedlings so you end up with a bountiful harvest of bulb onions. Number one, dig a trench about two to three inches deep. Number two, place the seedlings in the trench, keeping them about six to eight inches apart. Number three, backfill the trench until the bulb tops are slightly visible and the roots barely covered. This ensures that the onions receive enough sunlight and air for the bulb to form properly, while also providing like enough soil coverage to protect the bulb and roots from harsh weather and pests. So speaking of weather and pests, be sure to check the seedlings, you know, during your rounds to make sure the roots are not exposed. Curious birds, heavy rain, or strong wind can topple tender seedlings. So looking back over the past 35 years of growing onions, I learned a valuable 
spiritual lesson. I had tried all kinds of measures, you know, changed out the soil, added more compost, held back on the compost, stirred in sand, hoping the texture would help. But when Kevin, the onion guy at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, shared what seemed at first to be like a tiny adjustment, to my surprise and delight, it brought about huge results, and I've been growing onions successfully ever since. My onion story holds a precious spiritual lesson. Often in life, we consider grand sweeping changes when we face challenges, right? We forget the power of small adjustments, a kind word instead of a harsh one, a moment of quiet prayer in a busy day, or the decision to forgive someone this can bring about a significant transformation in our lives. As Gandhi once said, in a gentle way, you can shake the world. Similarly, small acts of love, kindness, and understanding, like the tiny adjustment in how deep to plant an onion seedling, can create a ripple effect that leads to a more vibrant, happy, and fulfilling life. I hope you found this helpful in some way. If so, give me a thumbs up and leave a comment below. I read all your comments, and besides, we can all benefit from each other. Meanwhile, keep your hands in the dirt and your eyes on the stars. Cheers. For 20 years, I couldn't grow up. I wanted to add that part about putting the comments either below or in the chat. Hold on a second. Water. Because we really do all benefit from that. And if you have, you know, a main takeaway from what we learned today, go ahead and put them in the chat. It'd be great because um, that helps me learn also what kind of videos, what kind of lives, what kind of articles to write for everybody. So what I'd like to do at this point is, um, and feel free to put, you know, questions or comments in the chat. I'm going to go and open up... Um, our Q&A session. Yeah, your questions answered. I have a few. Some of you uh, sent in questions ahead of time, which was great. And so I'm going to dive into some of those. Um, some of you had asked about how to start onions from seed. And I, you know, I mentioned I do start my own onions from seed. And what I do, my favorite way to do that is I, let me get rid of this little banner down here this little guy. So I love using the soil cubers, the mini soil cuber. Um, I start my onions fairly early because like I said, it's a, it's a cool climate, loves it. Actually, I think grow, onions are grown around the world. Um, but what I do is I create um, from the seed starting mix, I make up uh, just one and the seed starting mix. So it's like the consistency of oatmeal. And then what I do is, if I don't spill this all over the desk, is I pack it in here. I pack it in here and it's like making 20 little brownies. Yum. Then I punch it out in just a recyclable, reusable um, container. And I just put one onion in each little cube. And how do I do that? Well, I use a pencil. <laughs> Not quite this big, but I put the onion seeds in my hand and I just touch it to here and then I just wipe it off. But it's the best way to do it. They germinate in, you know, 10 to 14 days and you, you get very, very hardy onions. The one thing too about onions when you're growing onions is you saw when I was handling the seedling, it's a substantial set of roots. So when you've planted your onions and they're growing, be careful when you cultivate around them, as in scratch, 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 to get rid of weeds, because it's very easy to damage the roots that are very close to the surface, right? They also like to be weeded around them. They're kind of like a space hog in a little way because they, they do like their nutrition. And so I, I'm pretty careful about weeding around onions. Okay, 
Um, well, I've covered this before, but the question is coming in because we're kind of in that season here. You saw how foggy it was here, but slugs, snails, um, they leave a slime, right? As a matter of fact, scientists are stug studying slug slime because it's so amazing, really, because it attracts water. So because it attracts water, if you try and wash your hands underneath a faucet to try and get that slug slime or, or, or um, snail slime off of you, it's nay to impossible. So the best thing to do is to get some uh, powdered boratine 14-mule um, uh, um, borax. And you just, you just rub it between your hands. It's pretty gritty and it pills up really nicely and it just goes away, right? <laughs> Somebody had asked about how do you garden in bear country? It's, it's a valid question. I, I do compost in bear country. We do have bears that walk along the beach underneath our, the cliff we live on and they roam through our, our streets and they go through our yards. Um, we just kind of know and learn how to cohabitate with them. Um, so, so what I do is I don't put really smelly like smoked salmon fish skins in my compost at the surface, but I do bur bury it very deeply. I even bury um, bones from salmon and so on in my garden. But again, I'm very careful about covering it well. And even when I pull the shovel out from putting it in, bury it in the soil, even when I pull a shovel out, I'm very careful not to draw the smell up. Okay, Jody has asked, um, do you grow any garlic? Um, yes, I, I'm growing garlic right now. I planted in early September. Um, I grow a, um, it's a, it's a hard neck garlic, which is better for northern regions. It, it doesn't braid well, but there's two things that, are fabulous about hard neck garlic is actually three things is the bulbs are very large you know the finished garlic is like this and the cloves themselves are sometimes bigger than my thumb generally speaking it's very hot spicy hot when i lost my sense of, of taste um last year uh it was kind of a joke because i i would say a little garlic, fresh garlic in your oatmeal? Okay, that aside. The other thing too about hard neck garlic versus a soft neck garlic that you see in the store or it's grown in warmer climes is that it stores very well. And soft neck garlic doesn't necessarily store well. Um, bye, Jean. Thanks for joining us. Um, I don't grow Jerusalem, Jerusalem garlic. I don't know what that is, Jody. Jerusalem artichokes yes but i don't know about jerusalem garlic so fill me in elephant garlic by the way is not a true garlic so um i learned that too but i don't know if it would even grow here is fall the best time to plant garlic then yes it is think of it as like a flowering bulb like your tulips your daffodils that kind of thing so plant it in the fall whatever is appropriate for your climate because if you like Jody, if you're in a warm climate, right? Um, but then at the same time, you're looking at oh, weather might be setting, settling in. Watch the weather. You don't want to plant the, the garlic too soon where it's going to be sending up shoots too soon. For me here in Kodiak, it's within the first two weeks of September. But I don't leave it bare all winter. I do put hoops over it after mulching around it. And then the shoots will start poking up in February. And one thing about that day length chart that I showed you guys is you can use that chart to find out when your day length pops above 10 hours. So for us, we, we uh, find that our day length drops below 10 hours around October 20th or so, or this latitude of 58 degrees north. And then that means that plant growth slows, just kind of goes to, you know, like suspended animation, like the spinach. And then pop around February 20th or so, it pops above 10 hours of daylight, daylight um, 
and growth resumes. So that's when I start looking for the garlic that's been underground and it'll start poking up through the mulch. So that's a really good point. Um, um, okay, so here we go. And let me go to the next question. And, oh, this comes up often and I want to cover it because many of us are in the middle of gardening season. How do I keep cats out of the garden? It's a very valid question because cats do harbor certain diseases. So if they're peeing and pooping in your garden, it's, it, it's, it's not great. Um, first of all, two questions. Is it your cat or is it your neighbor's cat? If it's your cat, then you got a responsibility for it. Don't let it get in the garden. If you need to put mesh over, say, hoops over your raised beds uh, to keep the cats out, that's what you need to do. If it's your neighbor's cat, then you need to have a conversation with your neighbor and say, hey, you might even have leash laws in your community. Uh, what we ended up doing, because we had some feral cats that were getting into our yard and upending my pea seeds and getting through my, my carrot seedlings, not fun, is I actually had to go to the city and get a live trap. And so I live trapped the cat and took it to the pound, which is a no-kill um, shelter anyway. And there we go. So, And sometimes the owners have to go and get the cat and bail them out for 50 bucks. So they kind of learn their lesson, right? Um, oh, this is somebody had asked me this. Um, what am I reading these days? And I am an avid reader, all kinds. And so let me just show you a few books. I'm just going to hold them up for you. Okay. Um, Here's one in particular that I love, and I liked it so much, I got the audible version to listen to it, um, The Heartbeat of Trees. Just, it's, it truly is a heartbeat of trees. It's a lovely um, treatise on trees, right? Another one, many of you know, um, I'm very fond of bumblebees, and I build little houses out of them. I've got a YouTube video on how to build a bumblebee house, but... Uh, my inspiration came from Dave and um, uh, Dave, Dave Golson in the UK, and he started the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. It's a phenomenal organization, but this is a really, really great read. And then um, a gardener from the UK mailed this to me a number of years ago. It's not in print anymore, but it's one of the sweetest true stories of just faith. And if you go to ABE Books or just do a search online, this is a lovely, lovely, lovely read. It's like a bedtime story, but it's a true story. It's so good. And then I, I use this as a reference pretty often. Teeming with Microbes by Jeff Lowenfels. And uh, yesterday I had a soil scientist come from University of Alaska and she's going around the state and collecting so soil samples for her database. And, um, you know, she says the buzz is just the knowledge in the past 30 years of what really goes on underneath our feet as far as microbes go and the relationship between the roots and the microbes is astounding. And Jeff Lowenfels wrote, a kind of a beginner's guide to mycorrhizal fungi and the soil food web. This is well worth um, getting and having it in your library. And then finally, when I had COVID in 2021 and I'm hungered down, I came across this book, Kinship with All Life. And I think I probably read it and I've read and I've listened to the Audible book maybe four or five times. This will change your life. This will change your life as far as your attitude towards animals and creatures and even communicating with plants. That's another live workshop, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, check the chat. Oh, wow. This is a, this is a, whew, this is a biggie. Um, how do you get rid of ants in your garden? I've had to cover this because people were getting ants in their compost pile too. And at that point, 
it was turning over your pile as much as possible to discourage them from nesting. And, you know, I don't really have a good answer for this because I'm a member of the Organic Gardening uh, Facebook group, and this comes up frequently and all kinds of answers come up. Um, if you want, uh, I'll do that research for what they have found. Put your put your name or your email address in the chat and, and I'll follow up and, and share with what most people have found to be effective. Um, we'll just give that we'll just give that a shot for now and um, I'll try my best, Rita, to do that. Um, oh, the book titles, please, they are backwards in the video. Oh, you're kidding me. Oh, no fun. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Um, kinship with all life. And there we go. And oh, okay. Let me just move this over here a little bit. I'm going to type really fast. Okay. The Kinship with All Life book, by the way, this was written in the 20s, like 100 years ago. Um, and it's just, it's just lovely. It goes back to the silent film era. era. It's a true story. Um, um, a, a bunch of sweet peas. Yeah. And, you know, if... If you're having a problem with finding these, um, just, just send me a note. Okay. Thanks for telling me that it was backwards in the video. Wow. <laughs> Whoa. Teaming with microbes. And this is by Jeff Lowenfeld, by the way, like I said. And he also has a very, very good podcast. Really good podcast. Um, so look it up. A Sting in the Tail. Uh, yep, that's it. That's about bumblebees. And then the final one is the heartbeat of trees. Maybe we should start a gardening book club. <laughs> I love that. Okay, you guys. Um, you're welcome, Jean. And finally, what I want to show you are... Um, I started doing this on my um, Instagram uh, channel, my Instagram, and I'm creating uh, videos in garden devotionals is about connecting gardening and the spiritual aspect of gardening, which, you know, it's all over there, like the, the root of the problem or getting to the, you know, um, the low hanging fruit. And there's just so many inspirations involved with gardening. And um, I'm going to share first, you'll be the first to know because I'm going to share this is I am in the process of writing a book. I am writing a book about, you know, the small devotional books, 366, you know, garden devotionals, one for each day. So watch for more information about that because I want you to be a part of that because I'm going to ask you to share your stories and your thoughts. Um, and it's a little bit like Chicken Soup for the Gardener's Soul, which I co-authored, but it'll be in a short form and it'll involve all kinds of spiritual parts. So thank you so much, you guys. And I look forward to the next live and feel free to um, email me with any questions. And thank you very, very, very much. So God bless you. Have a great rest of your week. Cheers.